Okay, so let's get started. Uh, thank, you, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to talk today uh, about code obfuscation and uh, intertwining of dynamic, static, and symbolic approaches for the obfuscation. Okay, so who am I? I'm Robin David. I'm still a PhD student at the Atomic Energy Commission in France. I'm working with Sebastian Bardin, which is a full-time researcher. Um, we're basically working in the software safety safety and security lab, which is primarily doing uh, safety for critical embedded systems. Uh, it's known for its um, platform for analyzing C code, but I'm part of the small team that we, is working on binary uh, for security. Okay, so what's the context? What's the goal? So the point is there is a lot of malware in the wild. Uh, some, of the, some of them are obfuscated, so we'd like to address them and to get rid of the obfuscation in order to perform some more in-depth analysis. So the first thing is trying to locate obfuscation if there is any, and in the second step, trying to remove it if possible. And all that, the goal is uh, to recover some kind of high-level view of the program, which is usually the control program. Um, the challenges, um, static, dynamic, and symbolic approaches used alone are sometimes uh, not enough for addressing uh, binaries that are obfuscated with different obfuscations. And obviously, uh, we have some scalability and robustness issues when dealing with such code. Um, our proposal is first uh, a new symbolic method for addressing invisibility-based uh, problems. I'm going to talk about it just after that. And we propose a combination uh, handling multiple kinds of obfuscations um, by mixing different approaches. What we have achieved so far is a, a set of tools for analyzing binaries, uh, some detection algorithms for several obfuscations, and uh, I will show a great example on external malware. Okay, so the long-term objective is to use a dynamic disassembly um, which is meant to be uh, safe because uh, instructions decoded are uh, have been executed. So we have a subset of the, the program that we are sure to be executable. And we'd like to uh, improve it with static disassembly, uh, but making the static disassembly more smart, if we can say, by uh, guiding it with symbolic execution and obfuscation-related information. So what's the agenda today? I'm going to do some quick recall about disassembling and dynamic symbolic executions. Then I will present our two proposals. Uh, then I will just uh, talk rapidly of the, the BINSEC platform that we've been uh, working on for the past few years. And then I will move on to the, the, four, the two case studies. Uh, the first is on um, several packers, and the last is on, is on X to null. Okay, so what's like to disassemble obfuscated code? Uh, the idea is to uh, recover some usable uh, representation of the program, getting rid of uh, what's, uh, everything that is useless into the program. Okay, uh, so yeah. Uh, so, and this is an essential, essential task to per perform um, before any in-depth analysis to understand what the, the program is really doing. <clears throat> okay, so the disassembly process, as a quick recall, it can be di divided into three steps. The first step is the code discovery, um, so finding into the big block of bytes what's code, what's data into the program, into the sections. Uh, it implies to deal with uh, instructions overlapping. For instance, on x86, the same byte can be shared between two different instructions, uh, depending on where, where you start decoding. So that's the first challenge while disassembling. The second step is the control for graph reconstructions. So basically creating the nodes and hedges to encode the flow of the program. So it implies to deal with indirect control flow, like jump, uh, dynamic jumps and things like this, uh, functions that are never returning, and yeah. And the last step is the partitioning, uh, 
namely trying to create some segmentation into the control flow graph uh, to create some the different functions in order to make it more uh, visible and usable for a user point of view. So <clears throat> trying to recovering the functions is kind of difficult because functions can share some parts of their code that they, they might not be contiguous into the binary. And it also implies to deal with tail calls. It's uh, when you call a function by um, making a single uh, a jump. <clears throat> okay, obfuscation, the, the broad definition of it is any mean that aims at slowing down the disassembly and the analysis process of a program, either for a human or uh, an automated algorithm. So there's plenty of obfuscation uh, used so far, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but what you can identify into them is that there is, uh, in the general sense, two kinds of obfuscation. The, the obfuscations that are more targeting the control of the program, hiding um, the edges in the graph, and the obfuscation that are targeting the data of the program, like ciphering strings, hiding the constants, uh, or hiding honey valuable assets into the program in order to prevent some uh, prevent uh, signatures or things like this. So we can there as a control obfuscation there is CFG flattening, jump encoding, virtual machines, and so on. And what we can see is that uh, this obfuscation also have an impact on the analysis that we can perform on it. Uh, as an example, uh, the last obfuscation is the obfuscation using, is using signal on exceptions. And this is typically the kind of obfuscation that we cannot handle uh, in a static way uh, because we cannot know when an exception is going to be raised and things like this. So the obfuscation have an impact on the kind of analysis we can perform on it. Uh, and I'm going to talk about two of them today so that I will present some detection algorithm. The first one is opaque predicates. Um, an opaque predicate is typically a predicate that is always true or always false, but this property is difficult to, to deduce just by looking at the, the, the predicates. Uh, you have an example on the right um, here. Reg um, regardless of the values that can be taken by x or y, um, this predicate would always be true. So uh, below you have the assembly um, of this predicate, and you basically have one of the two branches that is dead. Uh, so the question is, okay, why why doing this? Um, the answer is that it can it allows us to grow artificially the size of the code by hiding some dead code into dead, in the dead branches. And by the way, drowning the genuine code into it. So you can use whatever, uh, whatever is invariant into your program to encode uh, opaque predicates. It can be arithmetic, like here. It can be some invariant or on your data structure. It could be pointer aliasing, concurrency, and things like this. So we are going to, to deal with that obfuscation today. And the second obfuscation is the cold stack tempering. Uh, the cold stack tempering is basically the mean of violating the compilation scheme, saying that we are a red instruction is always returning to the caller. Uh, and because a red instruction is basically just a jump on the top value on the stack, uh, it depends at runtime what's on the stack at this moment to know where you're going to jump. And you have an example on the right. So this snippet of code is basically the call will push the address of the pop on the stack. The pop will pop its own address. It will then increment it in the head, push it back again on the stack, and the return instruction is basically going to jump uh, one byte further uh, after the red instruction. So that um, static disassembly uh, would stop disassembling at the red instruction, not seeing that the payload is really located after. So that's the kind of tricks that are kind of annoying when you want to disassemble an obfuscated program. 
<clears throat> okay, the obfuscation, it's basically, we would like it to be the full reverting of the obfuscating transformations, but sometimes, um, I mean, often, it's impossible to do the reverse operations because we are losing information in the obfuscation path. So we consider uh, the obfuscation, the fact of simplifying the code in order to facilitate uh, further analysis. <clears throat> okay, so a quick recall about disassembly. <clears throat> we consider correct a disassembly if it only disassemble um, genuine executable instructions. So dead instructions should not be disassembled. And we call a disassembly complete if it managed to disassemble uh, all, the, all, the, all the instruction. So what we basically have is with a static approach, you're meant to disassemble the whole program, but you can be fooled into disassembling some uh, dead data bytes or dead branches, and you're basically uh, blocked by all the dynamic jump here with the jump PAX, for instance. So you, you, the analysis do scale, but it's not robust to many obfuscation like self-modification and so on. <clears throat> on the other hand, dynamic disassembly will disassemble a subset of the program, but we are, we are sure it to be executable. And the main advantage of dynamic is that it's robust to uh, usually self-modification and this kind of obfuscation. Um, the shortcoming of this method is that it's dependent on the input. So that in theory, if you want to cover the whole program, you have to provide the, uh, the, all the possible inputs to your program. And this is where dynamic symbolic execution comes in, um, which is also known as concolic execution. So symbolic execution is basically the mean of simulating the program using symbolic values rather than um, constant values in order to obtain some relationship on the path. So as an example, um, you have this small snippet of code where there is two nested if, and I would like to know what are the conditions allowing to reach the print instructions. So in the middle, we have basically the, the graph of the functions, and in order to reach the print okay, you have h that should be less than 10, and it also should be greater than b. So that gives us some relationship on the path, and that leads to the given formula, which is a less than 10 and a greater than b, and a solution for that is a equal five, and for instance, b equal one. Um, usually the last step, uh, we hand it to like off-the-shelf uh, SMT solver. And going dynamic, so dynamic symbolic execution in the mean of uh, working on the dynamic path. So the first path, you don't choose it. You just run your program and you obtain a path of execution and you run at the top of it. So the question is for obfuscation, why, why using uh, dynamic symbolic execution? <clears throat> and an answer for, for, for this question is first, um, obfuscation usually uh, alter the syntax of the program, breaking the nodes, edges of the graph but it, you should keep the semantic of the program because you want your program to still do what it's meant to do after obfuscation. And by the way, uh, DSC allows to find new paths, like in the previous example, uh, with A and B, we would have the satisfying inputs for the two parameters of the functions to get into that path. So that, that's a valuable analysis in our case. <clears throat> a more complicated example. So let's consider that um, we have a switch with four ca uh, three cases, the assembly uh, obtained, and what we have obtained with dynamic execution. So we obtain uh, a piece of uh, the control program. And if, you want, if we want, for instance, to reach the case C, which is meant to be two, uh, we get that path, and we obtain the, the relationship on that path in order to, to take this path into the program. So it allows us to generate inputs for covering path, but uh, as you can uh, notice here, we have missed one of the, 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 the target of the jump PAX of the switch. 
So we can basically ask, OK, what could be the values for EAX at that point of the program so that uh, you can maybe find new uh, jump targets? So it basically gives the, the given formula. You want EAX to be different from 0 and 2. And the solution for that is 1, uh, because uh, we have missed one of the, of the, the nodes. So that's the main advantage of using dynamic symbolic execution in theory. <clears throat> so going dynamic, uh, have the advantage of uh, having a feasible path. So we are sure it to be feasible into the program. We can potentially generate new inputs. And it allows to thwart uh, basic tricks of obfuscation, like code overlapping, self-modification, and things like this. So in comparison to static and dynamic, uh, it's robust and correct thanks to dynamic uh, aspects. And it's more complete because it allows to uh, generate new path. The main shortcomings of these methods is that it has some scalability issues because uh, when you, have, you obtain some strong um, relation on the path, they might be really difficult to solve. And that makes it really difficult to scale then. OK, so we have dynamic symbolic execution. It allows us to find new targets for dynamic jumps to cover new branches and so on. But what if instead we want to check some infeasibility properties? Like we want to make sure that a red instruction is always going to return to the call instructions. Or another example for a pack predicates, we want to, to check that we are always going to check to take uh, one of the two branches. So we would like to check the infeasibility of some events. So in the case of opaque predicates, it would be the infeasibility of going into one of the two branches. So there is a problem. The, the standard forward DSE is not really adapt for such problem. And that's why we propose uh, a new approach, which is the backward bounded DSE. So it's a complementary approach to forward DSE. So the basic idea is that you have, for instance, here a conditional jump, and you would like to check that we cannot take, for instance, one of the two branches. So you're going to execute it symbolically in a backward manner. Uh, if you don't go back enough, you will, have, uh, you will not prove it to be invisible. If you manage, for instance, here to return to the email, uh, you will prove that you cannot get into the branch. And if you manage to go up to here, for instance, you are complete because you have backtracked on all the dependencies of the registers. <clears throat> Another example is for call stack tampering. So basically, if you have a red instructions here, you go back to the return to the call by symbolically executing it backward. And you can have a false negative if you don't go back enough. And, and uh, you can be correct if you find here, there we have the tempering. And you can manage to be complete if you cover all the branches leading to that red instruction. OK, so as a summary, uh, the backward bounded DAC uh, is bounded. So the main advantage to this approach is that it scale to whatever trust, execution trust length you're dealing with. And that's important for obfuscation. And it does not solve the same problem that standard uh, DSC. So it's a complementary approach. The point is that here, for instance, if you go back four steps backward, uh, you, from the logical point of view, you're going to over approximate all the possible path leading to that location. And moving one step further, uh, if you have approved your property by moving four steps backward, uh, it will still be uh, infeasible by moving five steps. <clears throat> so um, it's not false negative, neither false positive free, but um, the rates are quite low. <clears throat> okay. What about the bound selection? Uh, so typically for call stack tempering, we are going to return from the red to the call. And for opaque predicates, 
uh, the, the point is finding the, the, the right balance between the false negative you can, you can have and the false positive. And by be benchmarking classical opaque predicates that we have found, um, usually uh, 16 to 20 instruction backward was enough for proving the, the opacity of predicates. <clears throat> so the idea is to use this algorithm into a combination of dynamic disassembly, static disassembly, and dynamic symbolic execution. And the idea is to compute some obfuscation related data with uh, symbolic execution and provide it to static disassembly in order to preventing it to disassemble dead branches, um, telling him to disassemble red uh, targets and things like this. <clears throat> so the idea is from a safe uh, partial uh, graph, you <clears throat> improve it with static disassembly guided by dynamic symbolic execution. And you can potentially, with dynamic symbolic execution, by the way, generate new inputs for generating new traces and so on. <clears throat> so as an example, here you, we have a partial graph obtained by um, running the program. We have uh, handled some targets for dynamic jumps. Because we are doing it dynamically, we can uh, handle some layers of self-modification <clears throat> because we are simply going to execute them. Um, then we can enlarge the, the control flow graph uh, with static disassembly and also preventing the static disassembly to disassemble, for instance, here, uh, a dead branches. If we manage to prove that it's opaque, we can man instruct the static disassembly to disassemble red uh, target if they are not returning to the call. And obviously, we, we can instruct the static disassembly not to disassemble um, the instruction right after the call if we never return to it. So the bi basic idea is to obtain some more uh, safe and precise disassembly of the program. <clears throat> OK, so this combination and these algorithms, we are implementing it, them into BINSEC, which is our platform for binary analysis. It's basically composed of three entities. Uh, the main platform, BINSEC, which is doing static analysis, symbolic executions, and many other functionalities. We are using uh, a tool called PINSEC, which is our dynamic instrumentation, which is basically based on PIN. So for now, we only do x86. And the last entity is HIDASEC, which is a um, um, HIDA plugin for triggering analysis, recovering the results, and so on. And all these three entities are communicating with message queuing and zero MQ. OK, so PINSEC is based on PIN, uh, not the latest versions, but the one before. It can generate, obviously, execution trace in protobuf. It works on Linux Windows. We can configure it with a JSON file, for instance, if you'd like to do some on-the-fly value patching or, or these kind of things. And it keeps track of the self-modification layer that we, we might be executing. Um, problem is that we don't have all the anti-debug, all the anti-VM countermeasures that might be used by malware for evading such instrumentation. Uh, then BeanSec. It basically provides a front end for x86 into our intermediate representation and provides some static analysis, abstract interpretation, and I did implement it, the dynamic symbolic execution. So we provide many functionalities um, for path coverage and so on. And the most uh, critical point on which we uh, have invested most of our time was the path predicate optimization because in the end, uh, the problem is always the scalability of the formula you are going to generate. So this is the most critical part. You have to, to generate formulas that are uh, optimized enough to be solvable in a reasonable amount of time. So there's a lot of other uh, dynamic symbolic execution out there, Triton, Mayhem, S2E, and basically all the CGC challenger of the DARPA challenge. 
um, IDA. It's a um, plugin for IDA that leverage the results of the analysis into IDA because it provides some nice UI and high level um, functionality for manipulating binaries. So we take advantage of this. And it basically, yeah, do the post analysis of the results. <clears throat> okay, so that's great, but uh, let's move on to the concrete uh, studies. So we selected uh, 33 packers from the wild, and we, we, we say, okay, let's try to find if there is some opaque predicates or cold stack tampering into them. Um, so we basically analyzed thir the 30, 33 of them. We bounded the execution to with 10 million instructions, and the goal was basically to perform some kind of fully automated and systematic analysis of the packers to, to validate our approaches. So this is the result. They are not complete, but um, uh, this is some of them. That's kind of dense, but uh, what we can quickly see is that, okay, the analysis scale because we managed to, thanks to the backward bounded DSE, we managed to uh, analyze multi-million path length path. So the techniques works well. And it basically managed also to find some good matches for opaque predicates and cold stack tampering. Um, and with that amount of values, it's beyond false positive rates. And the last aspect that was surprising is, for instance, some of the uh, packers only have one tampering for the red instructions. And um, it appeared that it was packers that were doing the tail transition to the original entry point of the program by doing a push and red instructions. So obviously the red instruction is going to be detected as uh, tempered. Okay, what we have found into, into it. So for instance, in AC products, we found plenty of opaque predicates and they were basically just chaining uh, to a strictly exclusive conditions. So GS, GNS, and we found all the possible uh, alternatives. So GP, GNP, GO, GNO, and so on. Why not? Uh, we found in Armadillo, uh, XOR ECX, ECX, it's obviously going to be zero. So we are always going to take one branch. That's primitive, but it's still working. Um, some uh, cold stack tampering into, for instance, AC protect. So this is basically the four first instruction of the program. This is push, push, ret, ret. So um, basically when you disassemble with IDA, it just gives you four instructions. So it's not really worth it. Um, another one that we found also in AC protect. So we perform a call and then we modify at the top of the stack the value and just return to it. So we are going to jump somewhere else. Uh, another cold stack tampering that we found in ASPAC this time. And the dynamic instrumentation yielded that we did enter into a new uh, self-modification layer. And so you can see the tampering here, push zero and red, but uh, dynamically at the execution, at runtime, this um, instruction, the move is going to patch the push instructions with the original entry point and then jump into the original program. So that's why we detected uh, that we did enter into a new self-modification layer. Last example is uh, an opaque predicate in ASPAC. So you have move zero into BL, compare BL to zero and G and Z. So when I reversed the program and looked into it, I was like, okay, that's an opaque predicate. Uh, our algorithm will manage to find it. But uh, the, uh, while looking at the results, uh, the result told me, oh no, it's okay, I've covered the two branches. So I was like, okay, there's something wrong with my algorithms. But by looking at the dynamic uh, execution trace, uh, it was kind of the same trick. And it appeared that the ink instructions that is on the right branch is going to patch the opcodes of the move. So that later on, when you come back in the GNZ, you're going to take the other branch. And that's pretty much why which validates the fact that it's interesting to do it in a dynamic symbolic execution rather than purely static, because purely static symbolic execution couldn't have detected such uh, tricks. 
Okay, so let's move on to the, the big deal, X-Tunnel. So uh, you've probably heard about uh, this group for the past few months. So that goes by the name of APT28, Fancy Bear, Sofasi, Sednit, Pondstorm, and so on. They have been targeting lots of uh, um, entities, NATO, EU, German parliaments, TV5 Monde in France, uh, and recently the Democratic National Committee, DNC. Um, it basically uses lots of uh, zero days to, to spread it, to infect the, the targets. And very recently, uh, yeah, uh, very recently, um, I don't know if you've heard about it, this, this Monday, Monday, there was the release of the details by Google of uh, zero day into Flash and Windows 10 for a sandbox escape. And it appeared that it was this group that was using it for targeting uh, uh, their targets. So they also use plenty of tools, droppers, downloaders, uh, rootkit, bootkit, and so on. And we are going to, to give a focus on external. OK, so um, the main malware is X-Agent. It's um, running on the infected machines. And it's going to, to find, trying to reach the CNC server, the control command server. And if it cannot connect to it directly, it's going to find on the internal network, if it can find uh, uh, the external malware, uh, to connect to the CNC through it. So external is basically um, a proxy, a ciphering proxy that is going to encapsulate all the connections into uh, RC4 uh, cipher and encapsulate the whole thing into TLS. And a friend of mine, Joan Calvé, that I would like to, to thank, uh, have provided me three samples of uh, external. The first one is uh, has been compiled in June 2015, if dates are correct. And he provided me also two other samples. And the point is um, the two other samples are twice bigger than the original sample, almost. So for instance, the first one is 1.1 megabytes, and the two other are 2.1 and uh, 1.8 megabytes. So, and if dates are still correct, they have been compiled, like the second one, they've been compiled one week later, and the other one few months later. So that would be surprising to add so, so that much new functionalities into the program within the small range of time. So just by looking into it, we, we found Lots and lots and lots of opaque predicates. So the first question was, OK, can we remove it? Um, and the answer is yes. So far, it works well. And one of the main questions was, um, are there new functionality into the obfuscated binaries? Because what we would analyze obfuscated binaries if we have not obfuscated one. And the, the answer for that is that we'd like to know if there is new functionalities into the, the obfuscated samples. And the answer for that is, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, OK, but because I've got rid of the obfuscation, um, this is the next step toward finding there is new functionality. I'm going to, to give some insights of either or not there is new functionality into it. So what's the analysis context? So first, we are going to go fully static uh, in opposition to what we have, have presented before, because it appeared that the malware was not using any our self-modification features. So we basically have the whole CFG, even though it's really big. And uh, a good argument is that we don't want to connect to the command control server, uh, neither to wait for clients to connect on the, the proxy in order to obtain some relevant executions. So we are going to do it fully static. So first step, we perform our opaque predicate detection with our backward bounded DSC and so on. We will try to recover some high-level uh, predicates, so trying to find what kind of predicates they have used. Then if everything goes right in the two first steps, we should be able to remove all the dead code and the spurious instructions. So basically, spurious instructions are instructions that are involved into the opaque predicate computation, but uh, only for that. So if you manage to prove that there is an opaque predicate, you can basically uh, get rid of the instructions that are computing it. 
and last, if everything goes right up to here, we uh, normally should be able to extract the unobfuscated CFG of the program. Okay, so a um, few points about the high level predicate recovery. So the goal is to compute the dependency on the predicates in order to backtrack all the, the instructions involved in the computation. So on the left, you have an example of an opaque predicates that you have found into external. And on the right, you have the uh, formula generated uh, in SMT. So if you basically backtrack on the two parameters of the uh, compare, you can basically normally recreate the expressions that is being computed. Uh, for instance, uh, here it's BV mule and so on. And you, you, if you fold the whole thing, you obtain the, the predicates synthesized uh, by replacing the register with X, Y, Z, and so on. So the idea of this is was trying to, to identify the different um, patterns that have used. Okay, what about the results? So the two binaries basically have three 30,000 conditional jumps that we all checked. The, the symbolic execution took one hour, mostly, uh, and the synthesis also, but I was not, um, I didn't really optimize it. It was in Python running into IDA, it's kind of, yeah, I could have done better. Uh, and so basically the analysis of the two samples took one hour and a half, which is okay if you, if you have time or if you want to take for many coffees, who knows? Okay, um, so basically half of the conditional jumps are genuine conditional jumps, which are right, which is good, and a significant amount of them are opaque. Um, and among them, we managed to find what are the, uh, how many false positive and false negative there were, and the question is how do we have obtained uh, the false positive and false negative? Uh, this is basically because the synthesis yelled that they only use two different uh, predicates into the program. So the well-known um, uh, seven times y squared and so on, and another one that I've never seen elsewhere in other obfuscators, which might be good for doing some signatures, or I don't know. And using these two patterns, I've been able to identify among the results uh, which predicates were false positive and which one were false negative. And we basically miss really few of them. Okay, um, then, then the, I try to find what was the basic distributions of the obfuscation within the, the functions. And it appeared that um, most of the functions are not obfuscated at all. So 3,000 of them are not obfuscated. And by looking at them, it was basically the the functions of the statically linked libraries that were embedded into the program. They are using uh, OpenSSL and so on, and all these functions are not obfuscated. Why not? But it allows us to narrow the analysis on the obfuscated sample. So we only have like 500 functions remaining. So that's a lot, but that's better than 3,000 of them. Um, the cut coverage. So we started from 500,000 instruction. By propagating the, the liveness of instructions, we obtained 200,000 of them that were still alive. And when you remove the dead instruction and spurious instructions, you obtain basically a difference with the uh, unobfuscated sample, which is for the sample one, 47,000 instruction. And for the second sample is 9,000 instructions. So that's actually really low. Um, it could have been noise that remains from our analysis that could have missed some spurious instruction and so on. So uh, we, uh, with these results, we are kind of uh, not optimistic about the fact that there is really new functionalities in the obfuscated samples. <clears throat> So basically, you have uh, the control for graph of a function. I took the first one I've found. When you perform the analysis, you are able to 
to flag the basic blocks if they are alive, dead, and so on. And this allows you to extract from it the um, unobfuscated uh, control flow graph. OK, so I'm going to do a quick demo. So I'm going to run um, Binsec, our as a server. So it, it runs locally on my machine. And then I'm going to launch HIDA. So this is external. Uh, this is one of the first func function, is the start function. It's kind of big, but not that much. I'm loading HIDASEC, our plugin. <clears throat> I'm going to connect to BINSEC locally. So, so here we are, we are connected. And I'm going to trigger the analysis that developed for, for these samples. It's the static opac, so an opac predicate analysis, but statically. Uh, we set the bound to 16. It should be enough for most of them. And we, yeah. And I'm going only to analyze this routine. Okay, so this basically generates um, JSON configuration file that is going to be sent to Binsec, along with all the sub paths of the the conditional jumps of the functions. And it should be okay. So we start. There is 45 conditional jumps in the functions, so it processes them all. And here it is. So uh, among the 45 conditional jumps, there is only two of them that were genuine, and 43 of the others were OPAC predicates. And we can double check it by looking at uh, the predicates that have been synthesized. And as you can see, it's always the same kind of. Sometimes we, we did not manage to replace the register by a placeholder, but we can basically see that they are all, all the same predicates. And among them, there was only two that were not opaque. So at the top of that, I've implemented like fancy functionalities for highlighting in the control flow graph what is dead, what is alive. So, so that tells us to quickly see what, what's of interest. Um, I can also highlight the spurious instructions. Here you can see that all these instructions are just calculating the opaque predicates so if you remove it, you can basically have the, the payload. And at the top of that, we can have, thanks to HIDA API, I've done some extractions to uh, reduce CFG. And here it is. So this is basically the, the function without all the spurious instruction and dead code, which is more visible and and usable for further analysis. Okay, so let's back to the. Okay, so what are the conclusions about external? So manual checking of extracted CFD with the original functions of the the first samples didn't yield uh, really significant differences uh, or any new functionalities, but that would really require more in-depth graph similarity like bin diff or so on for trying to find if among these 500 remaining functions we can find something of interest. The obfuscation itself is not really, it, it, it was quite of great because they managed to create some um, far dependencies between the instantiation of variables and their usage into the predicates. So the depth might be quite big. Um, and also, they do some uh, code reuse, code sharing between the predicates. So all the predicates that are, are not standalone. Uh, they are relying on each other for computing some parts and so on. So it's a kind of code sharing and dependency be, uh, with each other. And I would highly, uh, if you have, if you want to have more information about the external exagent and so on, I highly recommend the the presentation visiting the Bearden by Joan Calvé, Jesse Campos, and Thomas Dupuis. 
which has been presented at Recon, but is going to be uh, presented at BotConf uh, this year. Okay, what about the takeaways of Binsec? So this is definitely the tip of what can be done with Binsec. I've only shown what we can do with dynamic symbolic execution, but Binsec also allows us to do abstract interpretation, simulations, it has some optimization and really interesting things. Uh, so more is yet to come. The platform is really young. Um, it lacks of documentation, stabilized APIs, but it's coming. But still, you can download it, try it, and experiment with it. If you have any questions, just, just ask. We are available. Um, and the main takeaways of the talk is backward bounded DSU scales well. Uh, and we have managed to to show it on packers that are kind of huge in terms of uh, execution trust length. Um, the backward bounded DSC uh, yield really good results on external because we managed to to get rid of the obfuscation. And we definitely think that combining dynamic, static, and symbolic um, analysis and approaches is definitely the way to go on obfuscated binaries uh, in order to uh, handle the different kind of obfuscation we can meet into this program. And that's all for me. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah. And you are pre, you, you're in essence deciding how far to go back. Yep. You talked about 16 to 20 as being suitable for a, yep. a, lot, a lot of things. It, I'm assuming you just did that by yeah, we, essence, trying a whole load of values yeah. on a whole load of code. Yeah. Um, even though, for instance, on external, even though sometimes they have some um, uh, far dependency, um, we managed to recover enough constraints of, on the inputs so that we can prove the opacity of the predicate. So you don't need to backtrack all the dependency, but uh, by backtrack, uh, for the example of opaque predicates, if you backtrack enough to recover enough constraints on the variables, you will be able to prove the infeasibility. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we, we basically, for, for your question, tried multiple bound for this problem and found out that 16 to 20 was kind of great. Yeah, it was the best balance between false negative and false positive because there is still some false positive or false negative. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, the question was uh, if we're uh, the malware was in parallelization, and the answer for that is you should normally execute symbolically all the threads separately. And yeah, it's kind of difficult to model that the interactions in mirror memory that can have. Uh, yeah, that's kind of complicated. We basically don't do it for now. <laughs> Okay, so if there is no questions. Oh, yeah. Right. You're battling, you know, sort of like dependencies with these uh, branches. Yeah. So how, how would that handle stack tracking? Because there are some simple logic, but it begins like a couple of loops ago. Yeah. And does do anything to it? Uh, I've not looked into the CFG flattening obfuscation, but yeah, that would be a, a great deal to, to try to find the right bound and for dealing with it. But I'm not really sure that if for these specific cases, using it backward is really valuable. I don't know. Because it's not really opaque, right? It's pretty blunt, but it just needs to go back a lot. 
Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, so that's why we still have some false positive and false negative. Sometimes, just because we took the wrong branch, we will uh, falsely believe that this is an APEC predicate, while we could have come from somewhere else. I don't know if that's replying your questions. <laughs> Okay, so thank you all. <laughs>